As standard, the 1198S does not come from the factory with a slipper clutch. Now what that means is if you're doing high RPM downshifting, such as during a track day, your rear end might slide around and your chain might chatter quite a bit when you're going into a corner. Now that is acceptable to a lot of riders. I don't mind it so much, but I really like the idea of a slipper clutch. My 996 had been outfitted with a slipper clutch and I really liked the feel of that. So I'm going to fit one to this bike. Over here are all the things I need to fit a slipper clutch, starting with the clutch itself. I went with an STM standard slipper clutch, not one of their fancy Evo ones or anything, because I don't need anything too crazy. I just want something that limits the back torque the engine has. So before we get into looking at that, over here we have new clutch springs as well as clutch spring keepers and screws to hold them in. These are made by Barnett. Really nice products right there. I think these are powder coated black so they won't rust unlike the ones that are currently in the bike. And this right here is a clutch basket holding tool. You'll notice that it's two-sided. One side is for the original style clutch which is a 12 tooth design and then the other side is for a 48 tooth basket design which is what this new slipper clutch uses. So you need a tool like this if you're going to be upfitting a 48 tooth basket. Now while there's many benefits to a, installing a slipper clutch, such as preventing your rear wheel from locking up under heavy downshifting, there is one major drawback, and that is that it increases the wear on the clutch plates considerably. You have to think about every time you downshift, if you don't rev match, that means you're basically like slowly letting out the clutch and, and wearing those friction plates every single downshift. So that is a downside of the slipper clutch. A new set of clutch plates is like $200, but I don't expect to put huge mileage on this bike to begin with, so I'm not too concerned with that wear. You can also ride it in a way that it doesn't um, put additional wear and tear on those clutch plates. If you're just riding around the street, if you just you know rev match on your downshifts, then it's not going to put any necessarily more wear and tear on the clutch plates than a normal clutch basket would. You can see this is a beautifully red anodized clutch system right here. Very nicely constructed piece. See this came with the clutch plates. So that is really great. Um, this uses the 48 tooth design. So the, the reasoning behind this 48 tooth design is that it, at least the theory is that you get more engagement points, so it's a heavier duty system. But I don't know if that's actually true. I know it definitely will change the sound of the bike. So typically Ducati, dry clutch Ducatis have kind of a knocking noise at idle. This one is probably gonna be more of a high pitched uh, jingling noise just because there's more engagement points. Right here is where we see the inner workings of how a slipper clutch works. Take the hub off. These 45 degree ramps, you put a little ball inside of these little channels right here. There's in the box somewhere. And uh, the hub rides on that ball and pushes up these ramps when the engine is under engine braking or back torque. This pushes upward and allows the clutch to slip. This is made of aluminum. All these pieces are made of aluminum for the most part, aside from the clutch plates themselves, which are steel. And here are those balls that the, the hub rides on. And here are some clutch spring retainers, kind of contrast with the red. But the new springs I got from Barnett have red keepers, which I kind of like more. That'll look really nice with this. It almost matches perfectly, the red. It's too bad most of this you won't ever even see once it's on the bike, but at least you know it's there. Let's go ahead and get it installed.
Now I'm not gonna put the cover back on quite yet because I wanna start it up and see how it looks when running, when it's not obscured at all. Now the only sticking point of the entire installation process was the clutch holding tool itself. I did have to get the Dremel out and enlarge the bolt holes because they weren't quite centered to make it fit on the casing. And I did have to tap it into place with a rubber mallet a couple times, but pretty easy modifications overall, especially for a $30 tool. That saved me about $200 over the metal made ones. So still really happy with this thing, got the job done. Let's start this thing up, see what it sounds like. you can hear it on the camera but being here in person hearing this thing go it is a lot quieter than the one I pulled off there now I think the clutch that was on there had been abused a little bit the clutch basket had some pretty heavy grooves in it and the plates themselves were pretty squished in the little finger parts so that's why it was really loud it was kind of worn out now this one being brand new it doesn't have a whole lot of play between the little engagement points so it runs way quieter and it'll probably stay that way because there are three times as many engagement points. And there we are, all buttoned back up. And while it's not completely visible, it is partially visible. And man, it looks like a little jewel there on the engine. So with that installed, I think it'll make a huge difference riding this bike around because the engine creates so much back torque that this will help make it a much smoother experience. So that officially marks the last part I plan to install on this bike. So now I can finally go ride the thing. In the next video, we'll go over all of the parts and the costs that it took to bring this bike up to what it is today. So as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you all again next time.